Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us for the 10th anniversary celebration, part of the 10th anniversary celebration of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. And welcome to, to those of you who are watching online, uh, either in real time or in the near or distant future. We're delighted to be with you. Uh, we will be joined in just a few moments uh, by Ambassador Stapleton Roy, who will be speaking with you, but who will first be seated up, seated up front. Ambassador Roy, as most of you probably know, was the founding director of the Kissinger Institute in 2008 uh, and is now a distinguished fellow. Uh, so he is very much still a part of the operations and he will be with all of you soon. He will be joined by, and I would also like to recognize, uh, Mr. Richard Adkerson, who is the chairman of the Kissinger Institute Advisory Council and also the CEO of Freeport McMoran, which is the world's largest privately held copper company and also uh, the number one molybdenum company. We'll be passing around a quiz on the uses of molybdenum uh, to all of you during this event, and they will be with us throughout the afternoon. When Stapleton Roy uh, founded the Kissinger Institute, coming to it from Kissinger Associates in New York City, his commitment was to using the Wilson Center, the Kissinger Institute as a platform to keep leaders and publics, and this part is very important, in the United States and China. This has always been part of the mission. This is why we're the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Together, and we put China up front because we feel strongly that Chinese points of view are often overlooked in Washington. That's why we're China and the United States. And so Ambassador Roy's commitment was to, in the Kissingerian tradition, use scholarship use deep research, use knowledge of the relationship, but also knowledge of the history and culture of China to inform American policy toward China and to remind people in China and the United States of what is foundational to the US-China relationship. Our mission today, the Kissinger Institute's mission today, is to ensure that informed engagement remains a pillar of US-China relations. This has become more difficult to carry out in the current atmosphere. It has, at times, has been a mission that we are called upon to defend because there's been, there have been two fundamental shifts in U.S.-China relations just in the five years that I have been here. And those of you who are frequent guests uh, know that this is the way we view the relationship and that this is what we build our programming around. The shift that you're probably all most aware of is that we have gone from an era beginning in the 70s that was characterized by a commitment to engagement, to cooperation, to an era that is characterized more by competition and even by rivalry. This was stated very clearly uh, by the Trump administration in its national security strategy. Uh, and this statement, this is a rivalrous relationship, was received in some quarters uh, in China uh, with shock, as though China were somewhat uh, not only surprised but offended by this. But in fact, I would argue that the Trump administration was playing catch up in declaring this so boldly, that, that Beijing had far earlier reached a similar conclusion, couched, of course, in different language. China's tr traditional diplomatic language is far more polite than ours. Uh, but it had long been believed, it had long been acted upon, the idea that the United States uh, placed the greatest obstacle in the way of China's achievement of its ambitions. And so this is, there's an agreement now in Beijing and Washington uh, that this is a high, more highly contentious relationship. That's one of the changes. The second big change in U.S.-China relations is that this is now a global relationship and a global competition. It is unfolding all around the world, even at the North and South Poles. It is geostrategic, it is military, it is ideological, it is economic, it is normative. So both of these changes are unprecedented. We are co uh, competing with a peer competitor, and this competition is worldwide in scope, and it comprises, as I say, ideology, technology, economics, as well as military issues. The Kissinger Institute is going to strive, against the background of these two changes, to continue to help policymakers and publics in both countries to frame this new relationship, this rivalrous relationship, properly. 
I was at first quite resistant to the Trump administration's statement that this was a rivalrous relationship. I've come to think that that's the right description, uh, as, as good a term as any, uh, because in the case of a rivalry, unlike the case with enmity, it's different than an enemy, a rival is somebody who seeks the same thing that you do in a case in which you can't both have it. This is why we speak of rivals in love. In this case, the United States and China both uh, desire to be the world's preeminent nation. Uh, their efforts are not aimed at each other in the first instance, as they are in the case of enemies, but they find themselves increasingly at cross purposes. Uh, we look forward uh, this year and over the coming years to working with all of you, again, to frame this competition and frame this very complex but still vital relationship accurately. And again, the Kissinger Institute is convinced that constructive engagement must remain a major pillar of this relationship, no matter what else we might be competing for. So the structure of, the, of this afternoon's panels, we're going to begin with the topic du jour, which is trade and economics, uh, and the current uh, trade friction or trade war. And that panel uh, will be chaired by Denny McMahon, who is now at the Paulson Institute's think tank, which is called Macro Polo, a terrific shop. Uh, we're not supposed to promote our competitors, uh, but these guys do dynamite work. Take, take, take a look at Paulson's Macro Polo Institute. And Dinny uh, is the author, most recently, of uh, China's Great Wall of Debt, which he wrote largely here at the Wilson Center as a Wilson Fellow. After that, we're going to turn to the question of China's more active diplomacy. I said this is a global competition. It is a global relationship. When we speak of China's diplomacy around the world, we tend to focus on Central Asia and infrastructure investments, uh, in some cases Africa, or China's maritime periphery. We'd like to take a different view. We would like to focus on China's more active uh, diplomacy, investments, foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas. Uh, where China is very active, uh, both at the Arctic and the Antarctic, in Canada, through the Caribbean, and down to Tierra del Fuego. That panel will be chaired by Ambassador Stapleton Roy. And we're very sorry we had advertised that Anne-Marie Brady uh, would be joining us from New Zealand to talk about the Arctic. The threat of Hurricane Florence, uh, the illusion of Hurricane Florence, uh, caused us to ask her not to get on the plane uh, in Australia, so we're sorry that she can't join us. And then lastly, uh, we are going to deal with another new question in U.S.-China relations and indeed in China's foreign relations around the world, which is growing concern in a number of countries with what is broadly called China's influence in the U.S., in Canada, the U.K., Australia, New Zealand. And that panel will be chaired by my colleague Sandy Fo. So again, thank you uh, for joining us. We will now turn to trade and economics, uh, which Ginny will moderate, and we will have time for Q&A and your input at the end of each of these panels. Again, thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, the title of this panel, as I'm sure you all know from the handouts in front of you, is Win-Win or Predation. And when I first saw this topic, I mean, the first thing that I thought of is the old joke that when a Chinese official starts talking about win-win, what he's really talking about is China winning twice. <laughs> now, that would put today's topic in a very particular light. Specifically, it would imply that the transition that we're talking about is one whereby the United States went from being unknowingly being taken advantage of by China to one where today that it is fully aware that it is being taken aware of by China. Two years ago, I think that would have worked very well as a joke, but today it isn't. In fact, I'd say that that particular perspective that you know, China has taken advantage of the United States um, for a long time and for too long is a widely held uh, perspective. In fact, I think it's fair to say that uh, there is a sense that the United States has ex extended a, a huge amount of goodwill when it comes to economic issues to the United States, uh, to, to China, pardon me. And we've now come to a point where that has been taken advantage of and the United States is now trying to sort of push back and, and, and sort of do something about it. So I think Robert's already talked to, you know, in, in great detail about sort of the, the, the broader context of the issues that we're talking about here. So. To give you a brief introduction of who we have on our panel today to sort of dive into these issues in more detail. Um, firstly, to my immediate left, we have Hank Levine, who spent 25 years as a Foreign Service Officer, um, which included two tours on the China desk at the State Department, 
two tours at the US Embassy in Beijing, and a three-year stint as the US Consul General in Shanghai. That was followed by three years as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia for the Commerce Department, and he also led negotiations for the US-China Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade. And at the moment, he is a senior advisor with the Albright Stonebridge Group. And then we also have Yun Sun, who is the director of the China program and co-director of the East Asia program at the Stimson Center. She is also a non-residential fellow at Brookings and her research focuses on China's foreign policy. And so I thought what we'd start with, um, I'd put the same question to, to both of our panelists, is actually just to reflect on their personal experience on, on how China's uh, relationship with the United States has actually changed over the years and ultimately how we sort of got to this point. So, Hank, would you like to start us off? Happy to. Uh, first, uh, thanks to Robert and the Kissinger Institute for the chance to be here and inflict my views on all of you. Uh, a shout out also, he's not here so I can't be accused of trying to curry favor with him, but a shout out to Ambassador Roy, who in addition to his work here at Kissinger Institute, was one of the giants of the China field at the State Department and a real role model for younger officers. And believe it or not, at one point, I was a younger officer. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, Robert put it well, and, and Denny also. I mean, clearly, over the 35 years that I've been involved, either involved in or observing U.S.-China relations, we've seen uh, an enormous change. And to me, operationally speaking, in a sense, from the policy perspective, the core of it is we've moved into this space where the prevailing approach seems to be, number one, an emphasis on China as a threat, and number two, linked to that, the notion that to change China's behavior, they must be coerced. Uh, in the trade area, we see that, of course. That's the whole strategy with the use of tariffs. Uh, impose enough pain on China to get it to, uh, to change its economic system. Now, I'd note that this approach is not new, and in fact, over my 35 years, uh, and particularly 25 years in the government, that was often the focus of interagency and intra-department debates. Those voices uh, were always present, have been quite loud. I remember in the late 80s, once at an interagency meeting, I was accused of wanting to put the entire U.S. submarine fleet at risk by supporting the e temporary export of a piece of computing equipment to, to China for use by an American company. It was an extreme sense of, of threat and, and sense that we had to keep these things out of China's hands, even to an extreme degree. Oh, by the way, that transaction was approved, and as far as I know, the U.S. submarine fleet remains quite healthy and, and <laughs> stealthy. Um, but, but, but the point is, the, these voices are not new, and, and despite what some people will say, they were aired over certainly all the years that I was involved. The difference between now and then was that for successive administrations, I would say up to and including the first Obama term, the senior levels of the U.S. government uh, wanted to pursue the kind of strategy that Robert referred to. The, the, the notion was that engaging China, uh, helping, facilitating China's entry into the global economic system and global order in general was strongly in the U.S. interest, and accomplishing that goal and promoting U.S. interest uh, required what I would call a, a softer approach, uh, engagement, as opposed to a continual sort of get tough, slap them around uh, kind of approach. Now, it's not to say that strong actions were not taken over the years uh, in particular cases, but, but senior levels in the government and the past administrations tended, when push came to shove, to lean in this direction of engagement. That has, of course, uh, changed uh, dramatically, and uh, you know we can get into questions of why. To me, it's a, a complicated, not a, not a simple story. But but that's the evolution I see now. Obviously, one element of the change has been the evolution of views of the business community. But even there, I would add a footnote. You know, we all talk about the business community has turned more negative toward China. And the fact is, when you think about it, the business community doesn't exist as a monolith. It's lots of companies, lots of sectors and subsectors. And oh, by the way, 
very large parts of the U.S. business community have not changed their positive views toward China and the opportunities it presents. I mean, think about the U.S. agricultural community. Think about uh, travel, tourism, hospitality industry, which both wants to serve tourists and business travelers in China, as well as outbound Chinese coming to the U.S. and going to other countries. Uh, think about consumer products companies, which aren't targeted by the Chinese as strategic industries, still see enormous opportunity. And think about U.S. retailers, who again benefit from inexpensive imports from China that they can then sell in large quantities to American consumers, and also increasingly see an opportunity to penetrate the China market. Think about Walmart stores spread out across China. And so as we think about the issue, I think it's important to realize that there are huge parts of the business community that remain quite positive and haven't uh, significantly altered their views. Of course, the sector that has are precisely the, the, the sectors that are targeted by the Chinese government under Made in China 2025 and other policies. And these are advanced manufacturing and high technology. And those are thorny issues. And again, we can get into the question of, of how to deal with them. But important, I think, to keep in mind that talking about the business community perspective on China is probably a, a flawed uh, approach. Uh, finally, I just add, in thinking ab about the past 35 years of evolution, one of the other striking characteristics to me, particularly in recent years, is the increasing activism and involvement of the U.S. defense and national security agencies in trade uh, and investment decisions. As I mentioned on export controls, even back in the 80s, of course, Defense Department an intelligence community was a part of that. But I think, uh, particularly in recent years, uh, they have become uh, more empowered, more assertive. Uh, some say that's good, some say that's bad, but it clearly has altered, I think, the balance uh, of government policy making with regard to China. Let me stop there, and hopefully that's enough to stimulate <laughs> some outrage. No, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Hank. And uh, Yun Soon. Thank you, Denny, and thanks to Robert for inviting me to, to come back to Wilson Center to talk about U.S.-China relations. I remember about eight months ago, we did a like an annual summary of U.S.-China relations under the first year of the Trump administration, also at, at Wilson Center. And at that time, um, the Chinese perception was still, well, this relationship might be transactional. Then starting from the early this year, um, that perception has certainly changed a lot. Um, so I certainly do not have 35 years of uh, experience. Um, I've been home based in Washington for about 15, and I have uh, focused um, on the Chinese foreign policy and how the U.S.-China dynamic affects the trajectory and the approach of, uh, of China's uh, foreign strategy to the, to the world. And throughout the years, I have had a lot of opportunities to have conversations with Chinese officials, interlocutors, academia, students, journalists. And honestly, from from all these years talking to talking to the Chinese and try to understand China's perspective about the, the U.S.-China relations, my feeling, my personal feeling, is that this relationship, in the Chinese perspective, has never been trouble-free. At different times, with each administration, there has always been problems. It could be Taiwan, it could be North Korea, it could be domestic politics of China, the U.S. campaign to promote human rights and the, uh, the rights lawyer issues in the, uh, the U.S.-China relations. So whether it is strategic rivalry, strategic competition, or is uh, strategic distrust, the series that came up, uh, that, uh, that was brought up by uh, Ken Liebersall and Professor Wang Jisu from Peking University about six years ago, in the media and in the foreign policy circle, my feeling is that the prevailing attitude against each other has always been full of questions, full of skepticism, and full of problems. And having said that, I think on the working level, probably between the foreign ministry and State Department, and between the uh, Department of Commerce and the Ministry of Commerce, because they have to negotiate the cooperation, they have to seek, identify, and promote the cooperation between the two countries. I think on the working level, the, um, the comment seems to be the, or the attitude has been a little bit more positive. But I would say for the strategic thinkers 
and the, for the um, policy wonks who are dedicated to the study of U.S.-China relations, it seems the focus on the negative on the negative side has always been a, a dominant theme. Um, so how about today? I would say that from the Chinese perspective, the current development of the China-U.S. relations has broken two conclusions or two judgments on the Chinese side about the um, about China-U.S. relations. And those two conclusions have been regarded as the common wisdom for anyone who studies, uh, who studies this bilateral relationship. And the first one is, um, I think Yuan Peng came up with this, the vice president of Kicker, a few years ago, well, actually, uh, maybe a decade, a decade ago. Um, and the conclusion is that U.S.-China relations has a floor, but it also has a ceiling. That no matter how, how this relationship evolves, there's a maximum extent as well how good it can be. And there is also a maximum extent as well how bad it can be. So... Um, what, so what has changed under the Trump administration is that the Chinese are gradually uh, reaching the conclusion that there might be a ceiling, but there's no floor. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever they think that, well, maybe this is the maximum extent that the U.S. will push us on the trade issue, maybe this is how much the, the most extent that they will poke us on Taiwan, there's more. So this perception that there is always this floor that will provide almost a sense of uh, reassurance is, uh, is, is gone. And when they look at the problems currently existing between the two countries, none of these, well, maybe the influence campaign is relatively new, but most of these issues are old issues that have been there for a very long time. Look at North Korea, trade, Taiwan, military modernization of China. But these are all old issues without really a qualitative change in the past 20 months. But when they look at how bad this relationship has, uh, has become, so it certainly has surpassed their original expectation and broken that common wisdom uh, in, the, in, the, in the Chinese policy community. And the reason that it, succeed, uh, it exceeded or surpassed the Chinese expectation is because of another longstanding conclusion that the Chinese have developed about uh, China U.S. relations, which is the economic relations or the trade relations between U.S. and China, the word that the Chinese have constantly used is uh, ballast. The heavy stuff that you put at the bottom of a ship to keep the, to keep the ship from, from destabilizing. So economic relationship has, be, has been the ballast of the sino us relations. So the argument is, uh, although there are confrontations, there are issues that U.S. and China do not agree with each other, but because of the complex interdependence, between the two countries and how closely interlinked the two economies have become, it, this economic relationship will keep the bilateral, bilateral relationship from, derail, from being derailed. And that is also the reason that U.S. and China are not happy with each other. There are a lot of issues that they have discontent against each other. But regardless of all this discontent, they have to keep, they have to keep cooperating with each other. But now that condition or that conclusion has also been, uh, been proven no longer valid, at least under the Trump administration, because uh, if Trump's policy, the goal is to decouple the two economies, is to de-link the complex interdependence between the, two, between the two economies, then the expected result is that U.S. Chi policy towards China will no longer be subject to the constraint of the economic consideration. And the United States will be freed up to pursue its, uh, its strategic goals. But the, the core of this policy is that, more the core debate about this policy is, for the United States in this cost-benefit analysis, so to sacrifice the economic linkage with China, because that is a beneficial economic relationship, to sacrifice that economic relationship for the sake of great power competition, is, is that a good calculation? Is that a good strategy? So without economic cooperation or, or when the bilateral economic relationship is significantly decoupled or delinked, then the confrontational and the competitive aspect of the bilateral relations will foreseeably exceed the cooperative side of the, uh, of the bilateral relations. 
But is that a direction that U.S. wants to pursue? So, of course, it is understandable that a lot of people, especially in the foreign policy community here, feel that with China's assertive policy and China's de declaration that we're, the engagement is not going to change who we are. It's not going to change the direction that we pursue. So because of all these uh, all these. Um, elements and factors coming out of China, a lot of strategic thinkers here in the U.S. have reached almost a conclusion that China will consistently see U.S. as the goal, uh, as the one great power to surpass. And the, therefore, for all the policies that have promoted cooperation between the two economies, it helps the United States, but it also helps China to uh, increase its power in this competition with the United States. And since the engagement has not been particularly successful at this point, then the only choice or the only option that's uh, left behind, uh, that's left for us, is, um, is a more confrontational approach. So I think that's pretty much where we are, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, I might put the next question to, to you again, Yun Sun. Yeah. Um, Sort of given that uh, we're potentially looking at a U.S.-China relationship that uh, doesn't have a floor after all, how is Beijing and the Chinese government sort of preparing for this sort of new order? And I guess specifically what I'm getting at is recently we've, we've kind of seen a, a reframing in China of this trade conflict, the trade war, mm -hmm. as being an effort by the United States to keep China down. So is this just a tactic? I mean, there has been talk that this might purely be a, a trade negotiation tactic. Or is this potentially Xi Jinping and his administration sort of laying the groundwork for a longer conflict and sort of trying to bring the public alongside. And for that matter, is that sort of line of reasoning, that line of argument um, that, you know, this is, this is a, 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 an, an effort by the United States mm -hmm. to put China in the place? I mean, how does that reasoning have resonance among, you know, in China? That's a great question. Um, I think for, from the Chinese perspective, Especially looking at the, uh, the at the analysis that's available in in Chinese language, out of Beijing, out of the Chinese uh, policy community, I think what they are seeing is a is uh, is, is is basically a disproof of their original their earlier expectation about the Trump administration. So their earlier expectation is that Trump is looking for a deal. Trump is not looking for a fight. But now they have come to the conclusion that maybe Trump is not looking for a deal. He is looking for a fight. Mm -hmm. And when they look at what is the intention of uh, especially coming to the trade dispute, like we all know that um, China has made it quite clear that they are willing to make concessions on the trade deficit issue. They are willing to import more from the United States to to deal with the trade deficit issue. Then on the market access issue, the Chinese are willing to maybe deal with 40% of the, uh, the market access issue now, and 40% uh, percent of the market access will, can be negotiated, since there are 20% that is not really subject to negotiation. So I think that is also an area where the Chinese see that, well, we can have some co we can have some deal. But then it is coming to the industrial policy, the Made in China 2025. The Chinese feel that the U.S. goal is to stop China from pursuing a national strategy that is aimed at upgrading the Chinese economy's position in the global supply chain. And when they look at the future of the Chinese economy and China's role in the world, they feel that we have to. We cannot be the world factory forever. We have to seek some way to sustain our growth. And the next natural direction to go to is the technological innovation. So if the Trump administration's goal is to stop China from pursuing that, I think the Chinese naturally draw a conclusion what is what is the reason behind that that demand? And it's very easy to draw the conclusion that this is about the strategic competition between the two countries. Hmm. It's interesting. I think China is certainly or the Beijing administration has certainly been flat footed um, by what's been coming out of, of, of Washington, D.C. I think they've constantly had to recalibrate their expectations. I remember talking to a, a, a think tank researcher from Beijing before the before the presidential election. And what he said, and I've read this elsewhere as well, is that he said that um, they saw the election of, of a President Trump would be kind of like another September 11. And I'd never actually come across that expression before, but what he meant is that after September 11, the United States was so preoccupied with the war on terror that China effectively got a free pass for a decade. And that's what they were expecting of a President Trump, that there was so much going on and he was such a, a wild card 
that they expected that they would have sort of a, a sort of a degree of, of freedom of operation, and clearly that's not what happened. Um, so, Hank, to throw the next question to you, if we can go back to the, uh, the, the issue of the business community, uh, the, the US business community, um, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, it's not one sort of monolo you know, mo monolithic beast, um, but certainly traditionally US businesses have kind of been the, a sort of a bulwark of support for, for the health of the US-China relationship. And what I found particularly interesting over the last few years is the results of the American Chamber of Commerce survey of their, their members in China. And there has been a, a very much a diminishing of confidence that its members have in uh, the potential of the Chinese economy and concerns about the way they're even treated in, in China. There's a lot of talk about sort of moving factories off, offshore, you know, offshore, you know, away from China. And so what I was wondering is there, there does genuinely seem to be a, a souring of the relationship, particularly in some business, uh, you know, some sectors of the business community. Is it significant for the relationship? Is it temporary? And is this something that is or should be concerned to the, the Chinese authorities? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the uh, surveys that show U.S. companies feel less welcome in China, uh, that they express concerns about uh, the, the future economic prospects. I mean, I think it's important to bear in mind there are a lot of factors that go into that. And in fact, in the most recent I guess U.S. China Business Council survey, you know, the number one problem cited far and away were costs, increasing costs. Mm. And so, you know, some of what we're seeing are what I think of as ordinary business challenges. The Chinese economy is slowing. The profits at Chinese companies are increasingly competitive and, and not necessarily because of unfair competition. I was talking with a consumer products company, U.S. major company, who said, you know, their Chinese competitors, the packaging, the marketing, and to a certain extent the products, have really improved. And, and the, the, the premium that the U.S. company could get on the basis of its name just isn't that as important anymore, and they need to rethink their strategy. So there are a lot of factors that go into the sense that U.S. companies are facing increasing challenges in China. Uh, is it significant? Yes, it's significant. Uh, as was mentioned, you know, the business community has been the ballast uh, of the relationship, and certainly that ballast has lightened. Uh, the Chinese are in an awkward situation here, I think, because I certainly hope they will do as much as they can to reassure the U.S. business community, and the best way to do that is to aggressively implement reform and opening policies that they promised six years ago at the, at the third plenum. Uh, but the fact is, in this administration, the business community does not have the same influence and the same impact that it has had in previous administrations. Uh, President Trump is the great decider. Uh, Bob Lighthizer, Peter Navarro, and, and, and others talk to him and, and reinforce or shape his views. And my sense is that they're not particularly swayed uh, by the concerns of the business community. Uh, so, uh, you know, over time, and we're seeing this now with the tariffs, you've got 160, I think, business groups that are signing letters opposing increased tariffs on China. Over time, I, I would think it's possible that business community opposition will grow to the point that it will have an impact. Uh, more significant would be a sharp decline in the stock market because the president seems to focus on that. But, but the economic side, in other words, over time can perhaps counterbalance the administration's a current approach, a particularly use of punitive tariffs. L let me just, if I could comment a, a little bit on the earlier question. You know, when we talk about the Chinese being confused or taken by surprise and, and seeing grand strategy, uh, you know, <laughs> my view is they're as confused as many Americans, even many <laughs> American experts, are, b because it is confusing. And President Trump, for decades, has focused on the trade deficit. Uh, clearly, Peter Navarro sees us in an economic war with China. He is, I think, a proponent of decoupling. Uh, Lighthizer uh, has 
reportedly expressed the view that he doesn't expect China to change its economic system, and therefore we need to protect ourselves to the max. You've got, of course, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who has a more globalist view, would like to cut a deal, and so on. And so, you know, the fact that the, the Chinese are confused is, in my view, a function of a confusing situation. And l let me just say that one of the, I won't say it's an unintended consequence, but from the Chinese point of view, if you're sitting from the Chinese point of view, and the question is, is the U.S. out to contain China and out to harm China? You know, look at what's going on in the visa area, in the area of exchanges, uh, CFIUS investment. I mean, there is a very strong push to deny knowledge to China. The FBI has been particularly aggressive in a, a number of ways. Uh, and, and so just to say that the entire tone and tenor of the administration is in many ways an anti-China tone and tenor. And grand strategy or not, it's maybe not too surprising that China has concluded that the U.S. at this point is out to get China. Well, while we're talking about business issues, I'll stick with you for a moment, Hank. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, China's accession to the World Trade Organization? Um, because certainly in this climate, that's often held up as kind of the original sin that, you know, the United States, that China's prosperity has come at the expense of the United States. So how should we look back at that accession? Did China, did the United States lose out from letting China in? And, you know, should the United States have sort of handled China, you know, the, sort of the, the, the expanding export trade of China in the framework of the World Trade Organization somewhat differently? You know, recently and somewhat belatedly, I don't know why I got started watching this old now, I guess, TV series called Man in the High Castle based on a book about what would have happened if Germany and Japan had won World War II. And, you know, it's, it was, I found it engaging and the characters were vivid and so on. But, but it's a work of speculation and a work of fiction. And, and this is the issue with this WTO issue. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's very interesting for historians to, to pour over, and I'm sure they will for a long time. But ultimately, the burden of proof on those who say it was a mistake is to show that the United States and for that matter the world would have been better off keeping China out of the global trading system. And, and they can assert that that's the case if they want and many do assert that uh, but, but, but that's all it is, is an assertion, and I don't think it can be proved. Furthermore, most of the critics are folks who were nowhere near the negotiations, and it was 14 years of tough negotiations. In the end, Charlene Barshevsky was sitting down with uh, Chinese Premier Zhu Rongji and, and pushing and hammering, and, 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 you know, I sort of feel, and I think the negotiators felt, that they pushed as hard as they could and got as much as they could. And then finally... U.S. companies have generated billions of dollars in revenue as a result of the WTO accession. Look, I go back to the days when all imports and exports to China had to be handled through a handful of import-export companies, state-owned import-export companies. Individual Chinese companies couldn't import and export. Individual Chinese people couldn't import and export. Part of the WTO agreement was to break that monopoly and allow imports and exports to be done freely, uh, subject to tariffs and so on. Uh, so, so, you know, the, uh, the, the whole logistics, direct sale industry, there are all kinds of sectors that were open. Even the auto sector, while we continue now to be unhappy that auto manufacturers must be in joint ventures and they can own more than 50 percent of the venture, not a good thing. But, but that was a great step forward at the time and part of the WTO agreement because otherwise they had no right to establish. So I guess it's easy to say I'm not happy with the situation today and don't bother me with all of the history of all the positives that came out of it. Look at all the problems today. That proves it was a bad decision. And I just find that logic a little bit difficult to, to swallow. One more point. I found it absolutely stunning that the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative in an official document stated that we never should have let China into the WTO <clears throat> on the terms that were agreed at the time. And I'm stunned at it because... Think about it. I mean, even if you believe that, 
What, what is the point? Uh, maybe it's just my diplomatic background, but if you're trying to create an environment in which you're trying to negotiate and move forward and solve problems, what's the point of gratuitously sticking a, poking a stick in the eye of China? We never should have let you in, and it was a big mistake. W what is the value of that? Not to mention, as I say, it overlooks the fact that uh, it was a tough negotiation, and we have gotten a lot of benefit from it. But I don't feel strongly about this. <laughs> uh, Soon, going back to you, and after this question, I think we'll open it, uh, open up to questions from the floor. Um, there's been a lot of talk in China uh, that uh, chi that the country may have dropped its hide and bide. Uh, approach to projecting power sort of prematurely um, and that Beijing was perhaps too explicit in art articulating its intentions to become a world leader in more technologically advanced industries as, as part of you know made in China 2025 you know that sort of criticism that's sort of come out uh, you know over the last couple of months is, is that veiled criticism criticism of Xi Jinping's approach um, and you know, does it represent a potential gap in the you know, President Xi Jinping's armor? Um, and is it realistic to expect that, you know, given that this is a major point of tension, uh, you know, of the trade war, is it realistic to think that China might actually back away from its Made in China 2025 priorities, or is that really a non-negotiable? Um, great questions. I think to, to answer the last question first, I don't think China will back away from it, but China will back away from the rhetoric of the media attention that has been paid to it. In other, in other words, um, probably keep a more low profile on a strategy that has been so widely targeted, not only by the United States, but also by European countries and countries like Japan and South Korea. On the question as for whether China has uh, abandoned its uh, Tao Yang Hui, its uh, keeping a low profile, biding your time approach, and um, I think a lot of these criticisms on China's approach has been well warranted. And it's very much based on the assertiveness that the China's foreign policy has demonstrated starting from 2013. Then it was uh, more recently, the 19th Party, 19th Party Congress declared this China model or this China pass as a contribution to the humankind. Um, and then more recently, the, uh, this year, during the two sessions, during the Liang Hui, uh, Xi Jinping's term limit on the Chinese presidency or, uh, is, is being removed. So there are a lot of warranted skepticism as for where the Chinese politics is really evolving and what does that mean for the rest of the world. However, coming back to the foreign policy issues, I think there's, we need to make a distinction between the substance and the style. So if in China, if you ask a Chinese student, or we'll ask any chi average Chinese person that should China have more influence, should China have a more uh, a stronger foreign policy, given that China's power and China's power status in the international system has uh, has increased. I think the answer is mostly po is mostly positive. That people do agree that the Chinese nation, the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation, it needs to be manifested in a more assertive or a a different kind of foreign policy that is uh, that is different from from before. And if you look at the conclusion or the assessment of uh, of Hu Jintao's foreign policy. The, um, the, the one of the comment is that um, Hu Jintao kept a very low profile, but it has created all these problems on Chinese border. So the 10 years under Hu Jintao, the foreign policy was a decade of great inaction. So I think there is an internal momentum in China to push China to play a bigger role, to have more influence and be more assertive in, in international affairs. And that's the substance of this foreign policy. The issue that you raised, the, what people are critical of, I think is more the presentation of that policy. That yes, China should play a bigger role, but does it have to come with a grandiosity, like all the media narratives and the rhetoric has, has carried? And does it have to carry also the sense of almost arrogance when, um, when it is much smaller countries that China is, is dealing with? So I think it has a lot, the criticism has a lot to do with the style that China is pursuing this, uh, this more assertive foreign policy. And it's also about the timing, that whether China should prematurely claim that it is a peer of the United States, it is trying to replace the United States as a superpower when China actually is not there yet. 
Mm. What is the point of doing something that you are not ready to to claim something that you are not physically there yet? So I think there's uh, there there are questions and doubts about the timing. And last but not least, I think there are also questions and doubts about the purpose that this uh, this this grandiose foreign policy posture is serving. So of course, uh, the government's statement is that while well, it serves that to to build the image of the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. But in and outside China, a lot of people question whether all these foreign policy gestures, the grandiosity, is serving Xi Jinping's personal agenda to strengthen his authority, strengthen his credibility, strengthen his image as the most um, impressive and the most ambitious Chinese leader since, uh, since 1949. So I think those three aspects, the timing, the purpose, and the style, that the current policy is carried out is uh, are the ones that are raising questions. Well, how about we uh, th throw throw it open to questions from the floor? Um, we've got microphones roaming up and down the, s the sides. So does uh, anyone have a question? So one down the front. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Paula Stern. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, about the U.S. financial services um, community, uh, the business community. You mentioned ag and uh, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, how much, um, uh, how influential are they in the relationship between the United States and China? Um, are, are they captives, or are they potentially um, uh, a bridge um, uh, for uh, better uh, economic understanding? And my sense is, uh, first of all, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the framework I laid out, I put financial services industry somewhere kind of in the middle. Uh, I, I think they're very hungry in general to get into China. So far, they haven't done tremendously well there because of Chinese government restrictions. Uh, and, and increasingly, they're frustrated at the restrictions. So they still remain kind of hopeful and interested, but their frustration is growing. In terms of the extent to which uh, they are influential, uh, let me be a little bit impolite and say certainly, you know, many of the leaders of the financial community uh, of, of current and, and recent past uh, have been courted by the Chinese quite strongly, uh, Hank Paulson among others, and uh, uh, who else, uh, Schwartzman and, and so on, uh, John Thornton. And, and I think it's fair to say to date, uh, they have been very ineffective at altering the course of this administration's uh, China policy because, again, and again, this goes to the broader issues of the business community, uh, Peter Navarro doesn't care. Uh, President Trump himself apparently doesn't really care that much. Uh, and Bob Lighthizer, th these are folks who feel they understand the threat from China uh, the economic threat, that is, and, and they're not particularly swayed by views of the business community, including very well, very prominent, well-connected members of the financial service community. Now, having said that, it is obvious that over at Treasury, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, who comes out of that world, uh, is, is more open uh, and more supportive uh, of the uh, approach of the financial services folks. We will have seen in the last 24 hours the announcement that the U.S. has uh, requested a set of meetings to be led by Secretary Mnuchin, and one gets the feeling that he is trying very hard to broker some kind of a... Uh, an agreement, and I think that's consistent with the views of prominent financial services folks. But it's far from clear that he really has a, a clear mandate uh, from the president, uh, and it's far from clear that any such round of discussions will substantively lead to any kind of a serious outcome. So bottom line, uh, I think, and I think the Chinese have been surprised or at least have learned that many of these interlocutors, very prominent, very wealthy, very famous people, have not been able to deliver a lot of change in administration policy. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, excellent panel. No surprise. Uh, Marvin Ott, uh, Wilson Center, and Johns Hopkins. Um, it strikes me that this panel could be described as an exercise in cognitive empathy. And I mean, no, I mean that as a compliment. You know, that critical process of trying to understand how the other thinks and acts and why and what that means. And I'll tell my students in my Hopkins class that's absolutely fundamental to strategy and policy. Um, my question is, and I'll start with Yun, but for the full panel, could a panel like this be held in China? Mm -hmm. Could, would China be capable of putting together something like this where there is a sophisticated, genuine attempt to understand how the Americans think and why they think the way they do? Oh, wow. Um, I think the answer is yes. Actually, in fact, in the, in the, in the past six months, I've seen a lot of discussions in China not necessarily with uh, with with our American panelists to talk about how how Trump administrations think, and for the Chinese delegations coming to Washington D.C., that's also the que key question they're trying to figure out: that what is the goal of the Trump administration? Um, what are they trying to achieve? Where where are the rules? What are the rules, and where do they where do they lie? So I think they are making a genuine effort to understand that the U.S. psychology or Trump psychology coming to his China policy. But then from the feedback that I have heard, that for most of the conversations that I have had here in Washington, um, the people that they talk to don't seem to know either. <laughs> About, um, it's, it's like Hank just mentioned, that, that people here are as confused as, uh, as, uh, as the Chinese appear to be. And there are a lot of sessions, a lot of policy deliberations, a lot of seminars in China to talk about the current state of the U.S.-China relations. What does that mean? Where is this going? And I think they also try to make a genuine effort to understand the U.S. perspective. But then again, it, the kind of discussion also depends on what kind of information is available for them to, to have that discussion. And on that, I would say it's, it's less than satisfactory. Well, I would add a, a, a point which doesn't answer your question, goes in a slightly different direction, and just say but that, in a sense, you put your finger on a very important point and something I would like to think I learned as a young Foreign Service officer, and that is if, if you can't understand where the other person is coming from and what their constraints are, you're inevitably going to wind up with bad policy. And, and a good example, we've talked about it here, in my view, China is not going to change its fundamental approach uh, 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 to its economy, and, and that is industrial policy, uh, the substance of Made in China 2025. They just are not. And there isn't enough leverage, there aren't enough tariffs in the universe to force them to do that. Now, I, I could be wrong, but uh, I suspect there are a lot of longtime China hands who, who would agree with that, and certainly uh, Yun voiced the same perspective. And if that's the case, then you go into a trade war saying, I want to change the fundamental nature of the Chinese economy, and I'm going to use tariffs to do it, but it's not going to happen. And, and therefore, it, it, it sort of brings up the question, what, what are we doing, and why are we doing it, and what's the whole purpose of the strategy? So just to say that issue of being able to put yourself in the other person's place, I think, leads. And, and there are other approaches, in my view, by the way, which we can get into. But uh, anyway. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Dickey. First, thank you very, very much. It's been a terrific panel. Uh, keying off your last point, we hear a lot about the uh, rate of growth of the Chinese economy. And taking the numbers we get from China at face value, they're pretty impressive, even though off a bit lately. Uh, I don't know if that reflects a, a, uh, a positive cash flow uh, pre-investment, but to what extent do they monitor or care about uh, at all uh, the return on their capital investments uh, for in, the, in, the, in their uh, at their companies uh, of whatever nature, be they air, airlines or uh, uh, hydroelectric or any, any part of the economy. Uh, 
And as a footnote to that, you mentioned Hank Paulson, who's a serious environmentalist, uh, been there many, many times, and uh, uh, has, uh, to what extent in the capital expenditure uh, dis considerations, to what extent does the environment uh, uh, get any weight? You may want to weigh in on this. I'll get, I'll get beyond my depth fairly quickly, but i say the following. Uh, you know, the state-owned sector uh, still looms large, and recently President Xi Jinping has reaffirmed and the party has reaffirmed the importance of the state-owned sector. And clearly there, uh, the return on investment in strict Western terms is, is not tremendously important. Uh, private Chinese companies... Uh, are much more sensitive to that because it's their money at stake and so on. But so overall, uh, I think it's fair to say for these mega projects, uh, for, for the state-owned companies in general, uh, not that much attention and not to the standards that certainly that a major U.S. company would want to see. Uh, with regard to the environment, uh, all I can say is I know that, uh, you know, China, it's a priority for the Xi administration in part because it's a major source of public discontent uh, and unhappiness with the government and the party. Uh, it's a problem that's gone on for a long time. So they have taken steps to strengthen their activities there. How that plays out in terms of budget and money, I, I don't know, unless Yun has a better idea. I, I focus more on the foreign policy side. So with regards to, the, for example, the return of the capital investment along the, along the Belt and Road, I think there are a lot of questions. Um. Um, the international financial market is, is a free market. So if the projects, the infrastructure projects in these countries are profitable, money will go there. And the reason that money don't go there is because of concerns, economic concerns, political concerns, environmental concerns, social concerns. So with the Belt and the Road Initiative, there are a lot of, first of all, there are a lot of loans. There are, um, they might be concessional loans, but they are, um, they're not investment. The one set of data that I've seen uh, um, by the end of 2017, the total amount of the uh, concessional or the loans that Exim Bank has provided to BRI countries is, uh, is, is significantly higher, uh, not, not two times bigger, three times bigger kind of higher than the actual investment that China has made in the Belt and Road countries. And that creates a question of debt trap that countries, uh, the recipient countries cannot repay the loans. But if you look at it from the, from the other perspective, debt trap and lending trap, they are the same size of the same, uh, they're the two sides of the same coin. So when the recipient countries cannot repay the loans to China, it is the Chinese capital or the Chinese investment, uh, the Chinese loans get into, get into trouble. But if you were Chinese government and if you look at the, look at the policy and you are faced with an overcapacity problem domestically and the domestic market is saturated and to, I actually believe that Made in China 2025 is China's long-term national economic strategy and Belt and the Road is more of a bridging strategy to bridge where China is and where China, where Beijing wants China to be maybe by 2025, where China can, can achieve. But during this period of time, China needs to create enough opportunities for this overcapacity to not collapse. Maybe they, they can be faded away gradually, but to completely kill them off in a short period of time is going to create not only political uh, economic issues, but it will threaten the social stability and the political credibility of the Chinese government. So from that perspective, I would say a lot of the Chinese investment, sure, and the Chinese financing, they do have the returns on the back of their mind. But I think the primary purpose of these campaigns is to create opportunities for the Chinese contractors for the Chinese state-owned enterprises to have almost like a bridging period so that they don't, um, they don't die out in this, uh, in this saturated the Chinese domestic market. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, well, we've actually hit our allotted time for this afternoon, given we've got two more panels to go. I think we need to wrap it up here. Um, I'd like to th say thank you very much to our two panelists for their extremely illuminating insights, and I'd like you to all uh, to join me in thanking them. <laughs>